We're not 3 2 one We're good. We're good. We're alive. Hello, everybody. Hello, uh, everybody. We're Sophos Naked Security. I'm Matt Boddy, and I'm joined by Paul Ducklin. Paul I have to Ducklin. introduce myself these days. Yeah, sorry. I didn't forget your name. <laughs> and what we're talking about today is how to cut and paste your way to Bitcoin riches. Now, Duck, um, what is this? malware quite a thing isn't it it's it's, yes. it's a story that we thought would be fun for Facebook live because it combines cryptocurrency with data leakage so think GDPR the big deal in Europe at the moment and even in the US and malware so the very simply put the story goes around malware that has the very unassuming name of Trodge slash agent dash a z h f bit of a mouthful yeah. not very exciting i wish i could have called it coin grabber or coin <laughs> flipper or something like that but very exactly. simply it trying to steal cryptocurrencies not just bitcoin we'll get onto that but instead of cracking passwords digging into your bitcoin wallet or intercepting network traffic it basically assumes that you're going to copy and paste a Bitcoin address for where you're paying the Bitcoins to and that it's monitoring the clipboard and when it sees a Bitcoin address or a cryptocurrency address in there, it flips it out for another one that they've got in this giant list in the malware. And the hope is you won't notice and you'll click the button and you'll spend the Bitcoin with the wrong guy. And because it's not a bank and it's not a payment card and there's no regulator and there's no appeal or anything, you can't reverse the transaction and if the crooks are lucky, then they get the money because they've prepared this list of recipient addresses ready for their malware. So as far as I'm aware, we've not seen this before, have we? Uh, it's actually not a new... Messing with the clipboard is quite common in malware, yeah. and malware that specifically tries to do this for cryptocurrency has been around for quite a bit. Yeah. It's not new, it's just that this one has a spectacularly large list of Bitcoin addresses inside itself that it uses as the substitutions. So the idea is when you put in, when it sees a Bitcoin address, it doesn't just flip it for one that belongs to the crooks, yeah. it flips it for one that's kind of similar. So what is this Bitcoin address? Can we see it? Or? Yeah, let's, so, uh, let me, ooh. yeah, sure. Just need to get my notes. Of course, it's much easier when you're not live. So yeah. when, while you're getting your notes, yes. Selena says, hello. Hello, Selena. Hello. Where are you from? So I'm not asking you, sorry, Charlotte, I'm asking Selena. Did she not say? She hasn't said. Let's assume that she's from... Data privacy. That's why. No, yes, <laughs> that's why she didn't yeah. declare. Good. Good. It's probably not her real name either. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the deal is that Bitcoin addresses... Uh, can you see those? They, they're kind of long strings. They're, they're typically anything up to 34 ASCII characters. They almost always they start with a 1 or a 3. That's kind of reserved for Bitcoin. And then 33 characters that it's basically an encoding system known as base 58. It uses all the lowercase letters, all the uppercase letters and the digits. Now that makes 62, not 58. And then they leave out the ones that you easily confuse. That 0 and O and 1 and lowercase L. So the strings, they're not easy to remember. They're not, they don't, they're not words that you can easily type in. So you can see why people wouldn't, with, with, faced with a Bitcoin address that they want to pay to. And this is just something that the recipient generates for each transaction. They're easy to generate, there's no regulator, you don't have to go to the bank and get one. You just run a program that says, here's a Bitcoin address, it's a public key that corresponds to a cryptographic private key, and you use it so somebody can sign cryptocurrency over to you. And so you tell them your address, they copy and paste it because presumably they're not going to type in 15T4JRPWEEZ, etc, etc, etc. And of course, if the crooks can flip that over, uh, in the clipboard between you copying it, say, from their web page or their email and pasting it into the payment page, then kind of the crooks win. And they're hoping that they get the replacement close enough that you won't notice. So what's interesting about this is that we, we don't ever see this happening with a credit card detail because that's associated to a person. But because this is a Bitcoin address, with, it's far more likely to happen because it's completely anonymous. Well, you can do this. You could do this with something like a credit card, but it yeah. would be a problem because to get the money out, the crooks would have to say, well, that's my card. Yeah. And also, because there is some regulatory stuff there, you could appeal the transaction. You could say this was fraudulent and you could get it reversed. The problem here is that the recipient address is just something that as long as the person receiving the currency has the private key to go with the public key, they can then spend the coin in turn. Yeah. As soon as you've signed it over to the next address, even if that person doesn't have the private key, 
you've lost it. If they don't have the private key, they can never spend it. It gets kind of lost forever. But the point is, once you've handed it over, good luck getting it back. And that's the real problem. So to give you an idea, if you remember, we talked about 1, 5, T, 4, etc. If you were watching carefully before, you might have noticed in the middle line there was a 1 MAD. Uh, and at the bottom it said 1 HBL. So if I show you those Bitcoin addresses, uh, those kind of look very similar, almost identical to the first list. But in fact, I've swapped them out. That, that this, I made these up. They're not. You, you can't actually spend or do anything with these, and they're not the ones in the malware. But actually, that list looks really very similar to the previous. But if I just go back quickly, let's do that. Actually, what I did there is that all of the red bits. Whoops! Managed to change the volume somehow and set myself an alarm. It's amazing how annoying mobile phones are when you are trying to use them for another purpose. So you see there all the stuff that you see in red, those are the bits that I changed. Now actually the crooks have 2.3 million new replacement Bitcoin addresses at their disposal in the malware. Due to what we think is a bug, they only managed to use about 125,000 of them, but the first four characters that they replace will always be the same. And the chances are we're used to things being the same at the beginning of words and changing at the end. So you might indeed not notice. And that's the problem that we're just getting this blob of data. We've copied it. We assume we're going to paste it. This is indeed a risk any time you use copy and paste, if you think about it. Imagine that you've actually got a password in your clipboard. You go to copy some new text. You don't realize that you didn't press Control c properly. You paste it into a tweet or into some other field on a website, and you paste the previous, the stale data, or in this case, with this malware, you paste modified data. It's really easy to assume that because you didn't have to type the data, you couldn't have made a mistake, and that what you get is what you intended. We're quite reliant on, on clipboard in a way, aren't we? So, yes, it's a great way of moving data between yeah. one app and another, and very it's really reliable. convenient. Yeah. So how much have these crooks made out of this? That's a good question. There, were, there are 2.3 million Bitcoin addresses that they generated for use in the malware, uh, supposedly, presumably trying to match up as closely as they possibly could, with the, the, the have, have as close a match to as many Bitcoin addresses you might use. They only use 125,000 of those, so we went digging through the blockchain, and we went to see what transactions had happened with the 125,000 addresses that we think the crooks used. The good news is that only 28 of them out of 125,000 have received any funds in single transactions. Um, here's the list of the top ones. Uh, if you can see that, I've obfuscated the actual addresses. You can see that the amounts go from about a quarter of a Bitcoin, I think it is, let me check that, yeah, from about 0 0.23 Bitcoins are going down. That's approximately $1,000. So I've only put the first few there, but that's going down to about 100 bucks, and it goes down to the, the smallest amount was $0.04. Cents. Still, even though it doesn't look like much when you think about the hundreds of millions of dollars lost in hacking of cryptocurrency exchanges, these guys have still made, by our estimate, $6,715.66 at today's exchange rate just for getting this single malware that doesn't even have any network connectivity and it's just messing with your clipboard. So the good news, they haven't made a fortune. They haven't even made a small fortune. The bad news, they have stolen some money from some people and that's never good. And what, as an individual that may use Bitcoin or use some sort of altcoin, what, what can we do? Oh, you mentioned altcoins, just to make clear that the, the, the big list of addresses that this thing substitutes are Bitcoin addresses and the idea is as you saw there it's trying to get replacement ones that are as close to the one that you were using as possible it also has a much shorter list as one replacement in each case for a whole load of other currencies that's I, I never know whether to call it doggy coin or doge coin I think it's, it's doge I think it? it's doge but Hell it's based after dogs <laughs> a doge coin light coin Dash, Namecoin, Zcash, or I guess Zcash here for in the US, and Peercoin. So it's got a way of, it's got uh, text matching regular expressions in the malware that can match all those coin types and a substitute coin for each sort. Um, so what to do? Firstly, when you're pasting something into a field that is going to be critical to a transaction, whether it's a Bitcoin or an altcoin address or a credit card number or a password or a birthday or anything, an invoice number, check 
twice, click once. Don't just assume that the clipboard copy and paste worked because malware that's manipulating the clipboard, it's not going to show itself in other ways. There won't be network traffic, it won't be snooping around on your hard disk, you won't see files being created, it's just messing with what's in the clipboard. So the good old carpenter's adage, measure twice, cut once, yeah. so check twice before you click. Um, the second thing to do, of course, keep your antivirus up to date, make sure you've got a fighting chance of blocking this sort of stuff. This malware actually spreads as a DLL. That's a support programming library on Windows. Normally DLLs don't spread alone, they're designed to go along with an executable. But what this does is it actually uses the operating system to load the DLL. And a lot of people think, oh, DLLs, they're kind of harmless, they can't be loaded unless you've got another program. But actually there are tools on your system already that can help malware to load a DLL. And if you have email filtering going on, if you've got a list of extensions that you don't like in attachments that you find risky, or attachments that you don't permit inside zip files, things like that, you've almost certainly got things like PDF and XE and JavaScript and Visual Basic script on your list. Make sure you've got DLL as well, because they're not commonly considered as executable file types, yet they are. So that's an interesting point. So email may be a platform of delivery for this, but I'm guessing exploits could possibly that be, the, be a platform of delivery for the DLL as well. When, when we're talking we about malware that's just a particular sample, you need to bear in mind that the crooks can use one, some or many different ways of delivering the same malware. The most likely vehicle is going to be either as an email attachment or as a web link in a treacherous email that seduces you to go and get something, but it's also possible that you could get it through a file share on your network, you could get it through a USB key in the car park, you could get it through an unpatched vulnerability that let the crooks march in and plant these DLLs all over your network and then just wait to profit later. So, you know so what I'm going to say, aren't you? It's, yeah, I think I do. Go on, you do it then. Patch early, patch often. Absolutely. <laughs> Don't be the low-hanging fruit. If there is a way in that everybody knows, you can be sure the crooks know it, and they will try it. Yeah. Well, what, so, so we know what to do now. We know we need to patch early, we need to patch often. We know, that, um, we know how this malware is delivered. Um, so I think, is that everything from us here? Is there any other news that we want to deliver? on this story. No, just that this is an interesting combination of cryptocurrency, data leakage and malware. It proves that the crooks can steal stuff from you without needing a network connection to infiltrate the data. They don't need a secret call home or a command and control server. Basically, they're relying on you making a connection that you think is authorized, that your network will accept because you're doing it, and they'll just subvert the contents of the transaction before it goes into any encrypted layer. So that's the, that's the big deal. And I think the, the key message, once again, is that check twice Click once. Don't take anything that's entered automatically into any field on any website or any application uh, for granted. So this is a new way of criminals making money that we've not seen before. It's not new. Uh, as I said, it's it, the, the, the clipboard. The delivery method and clipboard is not. Using the clipboard the... is not new in malware. What's new here is this giant, enormous list of addresses yeah. that it carries with it. And we assume it carries this enormous list. The DLL is something like 84 megabytes in size. Yeah. The reason it carries this big list is once it's on your computer, it doesn't need to make any network connections to check, ooh, he's used this address, which one should I substitute it with? It's got all the data lying around in memory. All right, well, thank you very much, Duck. That was it's very informative. Be and careful thank out there, you. folks. Be careful. If you're a crypto coiner. <laughs> and watch what you're copying and pasting and Indeed. definitely read that cryptocurrency chain that you're pasting into your browser. If you're spending 800 bucks, it's worth actually going letter by letter <laughs> through with your finger. You can yeah. put your tongue out if you want and check. <laughs> it's worth it uh, when you're not just copying and pasting a casual message where you don't care too much about the content. So thank you everyone for viewing. Thanks folks. Thanks for your time, Duck. And go on, you do it. Patch early, patch often. No, I meant the other one. And thanks for your viewing. Yes, and the until next time. <laughs> until next time, stay secure. He got there at the end. He's coming home. Yes. <laughs>